Aruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Praise to you, Lord of God, rule of the universe, who made us holy with your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves with the words of Torah. All right. So, a quick recap of where we've been in chapter four of Pirkei Avot. We start with Ben Zoma, who said, who is wise, one who learns from everyone, who is mighty, one who subdues their evil inclination, who is rich, one who is happy with what they have, and who is honored, one who honors others. Then we get to Ben Azai, who basically said, it's all important, whether you think it's a quote major commandment or a quote minor commandment, you should do it. And you should try to not do things that you know are wrong, which he uh, dubs transgressions. And doing one commandment leads to another commandment. And if you do one wrong thing, you are more likely to end up doing something else wrong. Benzoma also used to say that Everybody has their moment and everything has its place. So don't despise people and don't underrate the importance of things. Rabbi Levitas from Yavna said that you shouldn't be so full of yourself because you're going to die anyway. Nobody gets out of life alive. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka said that whether you think you're transgressing in private, it's still going to come out. So don't do anything that you don't want to be on the front line, on the front page of the newspaper. And that was before they had the smartphone to tape everybody. <laughs> Rabbi Ishmael said that if you learn so that you can teach, then you'll get the chance to learn and to teach. And if you learn in order to do, then you get the chance to learn and to teach and to do. Rabbi Tzadok said, don't make the Torah, don't, a way that you're going to make yourself seem more important. Um, and he quotes Hill saying that if you do that, then it's on you when things don't turn out well for yourself. Rabbi Yossi said that if you honor the Torah, you are honored by others. If you dishonor the Torah, other people don't like you so much either. Rabbi Ishmael, the son of Rabbi Yossi said that if you refrain from judgment, then you <laughs> rid yourself of entity, robbery, and false merit. Unclear whether this means, as we discussed, that you refrain from judging others or you refrain from being judged, could go either way. However, Rabbi Ishmael also says that if you treat the judicial process lately, you are foolish, wicked, and arrogant. Presumably this is true whether you are in the process of being a judge or you are being judged. Rabbi Ishmael also used to say that if possible, don't make decisions unilaterally because only God gets to call the shots by God's self. Um, and since you should do things in a group of three, then that means that by default, you are not the majority. So. The other two can try to convince you, but they are the majority. Rabbi Jonathan said that if you prioritize studying Torah, even when you don't have a lot of money, then when you do have a lot of money, you will still prioritize it. And if you don't study Torah when you have a lot of money, then if you don't have a lot of money, you are still not like we just prioritize studying Torah. Mm. Rabbi Mayer said that you should balance Torah and business, and he would prioritize Torah, but you should definitely do both. Um, you should be humble before everybody. And if you aren't prioritizing Torah, it'll be very easy for you to be distracted. <laughs> And if you do keep yourself busy with Torah, you're gonna to get a lot out of it. And that brings us 
to this week's set of things. So, um, Sean, would you read, please? Rabbi Eliezer ben Jack, uh, Jacob said, one who performs one commandment acquires for themselves one advocate, and one who commits one transgression acquires for themselves one accuser. Repentance and good deeds are a shield against punishment. Some call this 414. Rabbi Yohanan Han Ha Sandler said, every assembly which is for the sake of heaven, i.e. its purpose is to serve God, will in the end endure. Every assembly which is not for the sake of heaven will not endure in the end. Okay, in their biographies, please. There are two Tanaim rabbis during the time of the Mishnah named Rabbi Eliezer ben Jacob. The one who said this was probably one of Rabbi Akiba's students active around 135 to 170 CE, who later became a member of the Sanhedrin in Usha, he and his students often disagreed with Rabbi Ishmael and his students. Alternatively, it could have been said by one of the students of Rabbi Yochanin ben Zakiah, so active around 100 CE, who was highly respected for his knowledge about the temple. Given that the other sayings around this one are students of Rabbi Akiva, it's more likely the former option. Rabbi Yohanan was probably a sandal maker, but possibly got the name Hasandlar because it sounded like the Alexandrian and he was from Alexandria, Egypt. He was one of the last students of Rabbi Akiva and managed to survive the Hadrianic persecutions after 135 CE. He had strong opinions about the correct transmission of Rabbi Akiva's teachings and once tangled with Rabbi Mir over who remembered the teacher's sayings better. How are these sayings relevant to our lives today? Thank you. All right, well, here are our sayings. How are they relevant to our lives today? We're all stumped. <laughs> Is there any real difference between one good leads to lead to another? Then one gets one point if you do the right thing, and you get a demerit if you do the wrong thing. Mm. So you're asking about like the previous saying? Exactly. Where it said <clears throat> the reward for one commandment is another commandment and the reward for a transgression is another transgression versus yeah. here where it says one who performs one commandment acquires for themselves one advocate versus if you commit one transgression, you get a, one accuser. Yes, I would say these are different. Related, but different. So uh, the better question then is that what is, how do you, who's keeping score and how do you win and how do you lose? Yeah. That is a good question. I'm going to modify the question and throw it back to the group. When it says one who performs one commandment acquires for themselves one advocate, what could that mean? Um, David? Yeah. Um, I had had my hand up because I wanted to say something, which now I think might answer what you said, which is with a certain kind of modern sensibility, or maybe even not so modern, this could even be the inner 
voice we have about our own behavior, where in particular, when we do something that we recognize as a transgression and um, are, are very unhappy with ourselves, the, the inner critic. So it's not just in some ways external assessment and validation, but also an internal. Mm. Isn't this also the source of a Talmudic teaching that um, when we come before the divine assembly for judgment, the evil deeds and the good deeds we have created have established either some, some sort of being that will speak against us before the count, before the divine council for trial, like after death and judgment. Is that correct? Yeah, there's certainly, there are a variety of views on it, um, but there's certainly a whole set of thoughts around the idea of the afterlife and your your good deeds slash good choices being weighed against the your transgressions um and and how that's going to affect you um it's related to the fact that religion in general answers a set of basic questions big questions one of the big questions that all religions seek to answer is why be good and if the answer is you should be good because then you get rewarded then the usual response to that is but i see people who seem to not be doing making good choices who are doing just fine and people who do seem to be making good choices who are having problems and so then religion in general usually says, okay, fine, it'll all get sorted out after you die. So, so this is, so one way of looking at this text is that this has to do with the sorting out that happens after you die, which could happen in a variety of ways since nobody has been dead for a long time and then come back and given us a report as to what actually happens. So there are many different ideas in Judaism as to how this plays out. And you have correctly identified one of them, Gabriel. Thank you. And just of curiosity, is that is it is it Talmudic or is it from like a later text? The interpretation that I'm thinking of. I can't remember where exactly it's from. I think it's Talmudic, but I will see if I can track it down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Yeah, but why wait? But these things could apply while you're, while we're still uh, on this, uh, on, in, in this life, rather than the afterlife. Because if, if, I'm, if I'm doing something that helps somebody or improves something, then maybe someone will uh, support me or say this is a someone who is worth uh, supporting for something else or he has a good idea and we should support him if he's doing something that it's helping other people or if you're misbehaving then people are going to they're going to accuse you might accuse you to others say don't trust this guy he's uh, he's a crook for example to use a word that uh, yeah, yeah. was used way back when for some other people who who uh, who had did not have advocates, but I won't get into po politics. But if you, if you can learn, I, you know, if you might be able to repent and perform good deeds and and feel much better about yourself and and how you how you're helping other people now, not wait for a reward when you're when you passed out. So I can I can see the apply the supplying uh, without considering whether it's going to be in the life to come or not. I look at it somewhat as what goes around comes around. Yeah, you could say, yeah, something like that. You know, it's like, in, in a sense, it's a little bit like paying it forward. Mm -hmm. 
I can see it, see it both of us in the professions when we are anybody in the professions, if you are a good professional, you try and cooperate and collaborate with your, your colleagues They're they're much readier, much more disposed to support you and help you when you have to solve some problems as well, or in anything in life. Uh, uh, it, 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 I, that's to me is uh, the sort of the compensation that, uh, that uh, I could foresee or, or the reward. And if you find out that just some of your behavior is not uh, eliciting a positive response, a supportive response from folks, then maybe if you mend your ways, you repent and, and, and do b better things, then you might find attitudes towards you change. That may be my own personal experience, but that's that's how I I I can see this, at least in my own situation. I agree with you. Where else do we see the idea of repentance and good deeds as a shield against punishment? How is that relevant today? Could you repeat the question, David? I'm not. Yeah, the, the, where it says at the end of the first saying, repentance and good deeds are a shield against punishment. How else do we see that playing out today? I don't know if this is going to sound, um, if you can hear me okay, but I'm feeling when I think about what's just going on over in Turkey and Syria, I'm sure a lot of those people were doing good deeds. So I don't know if punishment is having a building fall on you, but um, I'm not sure you can, there is a way to shield against punishment or at least disaster or difficulties, no matter how good you are. On the other hand, if you've got a good conscience, maybe you can shield yourself against things that you can control. Maybe I'm missing the point. No. No. I would say, um, perhaps adding on that a little bit, maybe that this is talking, at least that part I think is talking more so about punishment from the society in the sense that if you don't do evil things, then naturally there won't be anything to be rectified. So there won't need to be a punishment of any sort to do justice because there won't be a lack of justice in the first place. So I kind of think of it that way in the relationship sort of between, I guess, human actions and the world rather than nature or problems with nature, I guess, or the, the problem of evil, I guess, as it relates to nature or, or natural evil, I think is what the term is called, like mm -hmm. earth, things like that. So that's kind of the way that I was looking at it. The problem I see with this is that if you do something wrong, there's always somebody who wants to jump on you and accuse you of doing something wrong. If you do something good, nobody says anything. <laughs> nobody cares. That's not true. <laughs> no. So when does this play out where it says one who performs one commandment acquires for themselves one advocate?
I don't know how many times somebody is, I've helped somebody and then they helped me or vice versa. They remember, oh, you did this, you helped me out with this, you did that, or, oh. Uh, or maybe, you know, I don't get, I get stopped by the police when I'm driving for some reason and I say, I've never had a traffic ticket. This is a very everyday situation. It doesn't happen too often. And I don't. Then they said, oh, there's nothing wrong here. You have a good record. No problem. But you can apply that to other instances, other things, other circumstances. I'm just trying to give you a simple simple example. Can we not be our own advocate if we have a conscience and repent? Our exactly. That's that's another thought. Yeah, exactly. Do you feel good about you did something? Do you need do you need any other reward more, more than knowing that you that uh, help somebody? Yeah, I mean, you can you feel good about it. You you you're your own advocate. You don't need someone else to come and and put you know strokes on your back. So. Correct. You do something wrong, and if you have a good conscience, then you repent for it and and fix it if you can. Can you punish yourself if you feel bad you've done something? Oh, yeah. Or you say, oh. Yes. Send yourself to your room. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I think Norma, you're more. You can relate to this much better. better than oh, yeah. I can. Just pray. We pray. You pray on it. If you've done something bad, you know, as a way of repenting. Mm -hmm. Um. Could I try a different approach? Uh, when you ask the question as you generally do, um, how, how does this apply in, uh, I don't know where the, in, in modern times or in our times or something like that. Um, <clears throat> it, when, when it gets down to questions of this kind, it applies in just the same way, if at all, as it did with the rabbis, as you can be comfortable with it or not. Um, <clears throat> Because we see how the world, not much, how much we might twist ourselves around uh, in all sorts of different ways, not every way mentioned here and other ways too. Uh, we we know that we can't justify the um, the uh, uh, the uh, on its face the the suffering we have in 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 nature uh, to take a good point or or the uh, or the injustice among people. Um, <clears throat> So when I look at Rabbi Eliezer Ben Jacob, uh, and I look at the text, and I see he uses these words for advocate and the accuser. These are, are um, it strikes me, it's interesting that he's using, these are Greek words, first of all, these are borrowed words, they're not Hebrew words, they're Greek words. Uh, and and um, it's as if he's living in a, in a world in which he, there are these of uh, uh, not only courts of law in general, but there are uh, a whole set of, of, of arrangements which are imposed, by, powerfully imposed by someone else. Um, and and so he's saying, I think that the that the mitzvah is itself a kind of advocate, and maybe this is all wrong, and the and the uh, avera, the, the transgression, is an accuser in that in that system, and so uh, um, we should look at it that way. He's saying, I think, um, and then and then do the right thing, just as if that were the case. And one might or might not believe it, but that's the. Uh, but the answer, the question isn't to decide that abstract philosophical question, a uh, 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 philosophical issue, but to um, uh, but to proceed with our lives in in, in that way with our uh, about the uh, advocates and the accusers.
What would be the well, point of having a six, having such a saying? Like, why would he say something like this? What? Why would he say this? Yeah. Like, what? Well, what might be the motivation behind having a saying like this or making a statement like this? It's it's it, it's a way of of uh, elevating the stakes in our conduct. Um, and so that's why I think that's why I focus on the imagery there. You see these um, you see these two defense or these these two uh, uh, councils, you know, like at the uh, like in the job setting. Uh, um, make, making the arguments, and if you have the, if you commit perform the mitzvah, you get you get another voice in your support in that in that uh, in that scheme, and so on. I, I mean, your question is good, but it's hard. <laughs> well, this is not to to try and encourage people or motivate them, as you said in the beginning, to 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 follow the the what's the word I want to use the, the they don't use the word the constraints but the the um, the principles of of uh, our religion and the and what was expressed uh, condensed in the Ten Commandments and why why would the rabbis be talking about it if it's not to encourage people or to establish the the rules or the the how to conform to what what we've been instructed to do in the, in the Torah. Why, 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 rabbis, are, are they not trying to give us guidance, supposedly, to study, being they dedicate their lives to studying and trying to arrive at a better understanding of, of what the, the message is, or how to comply with it? Let's look at the other saying. Every assembly which is for the sake of heaven will in the end endure, and every assembly which is not for the sake of the heaven will not endure in the end. So, how do you know if an assembly is for the sake of heaven? Is this derivative of the other statement? I don't know where it is um, that every controversy is for the sake of if if it's for the sake of heaven will endure and will go on arguing the point. Is, uh, or, or, or is the or is it come the other way? Do you, do you, can you say if I have that right? You do have that right. Um... I believe it's an, another saying in Pirkei Avot, and I would need to look at which rabbi lived earlier. Well, I'm not trying to put you on the spot that way at all. I, I just thought that um, that if the basic idea was from the um, uh, the controversies, uh, yes. there's there's a way of of. Um, uh, I mean, I, I recently. Very recently, heard a a a, 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 a Lubavitcher a rabbi, a Hasidic rabbi, uh, in fact, uh, argue that these that these uh, controversies for the sake of heaven should go on. It was, I think, his way of saying that Jews can argue among themselves. Uh, don't don't take it as 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 devastating, but um, but if that's true, it 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 means that that, um, that we want to in some way make sacred that our our dis, our dis, disagreements but they have to be on a certain level and basis on uh, based on certain uh, common assumptions or the things that you know, falls into violence and treachery mm.
how, how do they know that this is true? I mean, no one's challenging them because they're the wise person, David. I mean, well, the rabbi says this, and so people will take it for the emiss. <laughs> So some of how they know it's true is based off of their personal observation. Okay. And some of the question about is anybody challenging them, presumably their own students are challenging them. Okay. Um, there's a, a story of Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, where they were study partners, they were Chavruta. And um, one of them made a, Rabbi Yochanan made a comment referring to Reish Lakish's previous life as a, a brigand. And he, he like didn't just attack Reish Lakish's statement, his argument, but he attacked Reish Lakish personally, and it caused Reish Lakish to be really offended. And then Rabbi Yochanan got sick that because he had offended Reish Lakish, and then Reish Lakish, and then Rabbi Yochanan wouldn't like make up with Reish Lakish, and Reish Lakish died. And then Rabbi Yochanan was feeling really bad about that, so they sent the Rabbi sent another student to to start to like be a replacement Chavruta and see if that would make Rabbi Yochanan feel better. And Rabbi Yochanan would say something and the other student would say, yes, you're right. Here's how we know that you're right. And Rabbi Yochanan is like, what good are you? Every time I said something, oh. Reish Vakish said, gave me 24 reasons why I was wrong. And then I had to give him 24 reasons why I was right. And then between, <clears throat> with the back and forth, that's how the truth got sharpened. But you, you just tell me that I'm right. Of course I'm right. I know that I'm right, or I wouldn't have said in the first place. <laughs> so, so through the process of students challenging their teachers and feeling like it's okay to ask questions, like certainly they're there to learn, but there's a there was a permissionness, a permissiveness to say that, like to ask a question of, how do you know that? Or I'm not sure I agree with you. And so, so there was definitely pushback, um, and and then if it wasn't like if it didn't hold up to it, it's like if a piece of pottery isn't made well enough, then it'll crack in the kiln. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to go out on a limb and say that if these sayings didn't hold up under observation and questioning of the time, they wouldn't have made it into the Mishnah and, okay. and then down to us. So David, is that why we keep questioning God to sharpen the truth of what God says? We question God because we're the descendants of Abraham. We had the chutzpah to argue with, with God about destroying Sodom. And we question God because we're the descendants of Jacob who, are, who wrestled with God. And whether we are the biological descendants or the adopted descendants, depending on when we became part of the Jewish people, like we get to question God. That's okay. That's part of what being Jewish is about. And therefore, I could question Hillel and vice versa for the yep. same reason. Yeah. The, the rabbis in the Talmud if you just read it without knowing anything about the rabbis, it reads as if, even the Mishnah, it reads as if they're all sitting in a room together and someone's just taking transcription as to their discussions. But then when you look at their biographies, you're like, wait a second, you weren't alive at the same time. So like, you're having a conversation, but and some of it is like, I don't say it's imagined how they would respond to each other, but it's like, you, you can push back on what somebody was saying from generations before you, and that's okay. And even after the mission was closed, and then after the Gemara was closed, like, at, when we do Torah study, 
we can push back on previous on the people that were studying and be like that might have been okay for you to say in your time but i'm not so sure that it still holds today david they're all sitting around a table in heaven and they're arguing with one another directly entirely yeah. possible some think that that is what the afterlife is is all about these being people who like this sort of thing if you like this idea of study torah study then for you the afterlife is very appealing if it involves Torah study all the time. Uh, David. Yeah. I just wonder whether this the sentence repentance and good deals are a shield against punishment somehow I, i'm just thinking that the holocaust you know kind of denies that you know um and you know it just feels to me that uh, you know assemblies for the sake of heaven and uh You know, it's, it's, I don't know. Right now, I'm kind of reading this uh, history of Jewish civilization. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was just finished reading about, about Luther and uh, how at first it was very complimentary about the Jews. And then, uh, you know, towards the end of his life, he, it, he totally flipped. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, wanted them all murdered. So, you know, depending on what, what side you're on, um, you know, will we'll depend on whether you think your assembly is for the sake of heaven or not, you know. That's true. <laughs> David, do we know in that sentence, um, who is the punisher? I mean, is it God or is it man? Because I, you know, I could see that I keep coming back to the uh, the problems in our legal system, where even if when people have served their their punishment, where they've gone on to turn their lives around in prison, but when they're let out, you know, they can't get ahead because society won't recognize how they may have changed. Um, so I'm just thinking, or I'm wondering if, if this is God's, uh, you know, God won't punish you if you repent, but we can't guarantee that man and your community and society won't continue doing so, even if you do repent. Yes. So, under the idea that God knows your true intentions in a way that's impossible for people, then it makes sense to say that God can recognize your, your actual repentance and that will, that will shield you against divine punishment which is not necessarily the same thing as bad things happening to you, like earthquakes or humans exercising their free will and causing the Holocaust. But whatever divine punishment might have happened won't happen because of repentance. It sometimes plays out in the human world where people make comments 
or make or do actions and then are able to convince enough others that that was me in the past. I no longer feel that way. I no longer believe that I have changed. Sometimes they're able to successfully avert punishment from others. Sometimes they're not. <clears throat> um, there are laws that have been passed in Illinois um, trying to trying to make it such that a felony conviction does not necessarily hold you back if you have turned your life around um, once you've gotten out, such as the question of being able to vote mm -hmm. after you've been released from jail or not. Yeah. Uh, so these are good questions. These are tough questions. And I recognize the time, so I'm going to end our recording now.